Hello and welcome back to another episode of IG's Trading the Markets podcast. Today I'm joined by Kevin Carter, who is the founder and chief investment officer of the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF, which trades under the ticker EMQQ. And we're going to talk about markets, emerging markets and e-commerce. Now, Kevin, you and I have talked in the past about this specific fund and one of its main attributes is that it, it excludes the Chinese market. Can you remind us why that is? What's the appeal of an ex china ETF aside from the recent regulatory issues that we've seen in the country? Sure. Well, just to be clear, we have actually three different offerings. One is EMQQ, which you referenced, which does include China and the other 45 emerging and frontier markets. But more recently, we launched FMQQ, the next frontier internet and e-commerce ETF. And it tracks the same thing as EMQQ, but without China. And The reality is that every country in the world gets categorized by the index providers as either developed, emerging, or frontier. And China certainly is an emerging market by the traditional measures, which includes mainly per capita GDP or average incomes. And so China is emerging based on the traditional metrics. But if we were going to reclassify every country in the world based on the internet and e-commerce, well, China is the most developed in the world. So China's e-commerce market is about four times as big as every other emerging market combined. So China's e-commerce market is very developed. Uh, it's still growing and it will continue to grow at a good rate. But there's a third wave that's just starting. So if you think about the internet and the consumer internet, in the world, there's been two big waves so far. The first one was the wave that we were on in the United States and the rest of the developed world. And that started about the year 2000 with companies like Amazon and eBay, later on Facebook and Google. And we saw what happened to our lives and and to our stock market. The fangs ate the whole world basically. And then starting in 2005, you had the China version of the story is a billion people in China got their first computer and first internet access via smartphone. And now there's a third wave that's starting in the rest of the developing world. And it's very early. The e-commerce penetration in China is about 30%. E-commerce penetration in India, Africa, Brazil is about 4%. So you're way, way behind at the very beginning of the story, but it's happening very fast. Billions of people are are getting their first ever computer, their first internet access, and their lives are going digital at an incredible rate. Let's look at the performance year to date of some of these companies, because if we're looking at emerging market tech companies, they've seen some poor performance. Now, is this specific because of the the period that they're in, you were talking there, the difference between China being about 30% of the way in its, 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 its tech company, its development, whereas some of these emerging markets are still very, very new. Is this performance that we've seen something that's normal? Is that why you're still bullish in the in this fund in the long term? Or what what's the what's the explanation behind this poor performance, if you may, of these emerging tech companies? Well, the performance in the last six months has been worse than poor, it's been horrible. And the last 14 months, uh, even worse. And, you know, I think it, at one point from the, our top last February until our lowest point in the last year, we were down almost 70%. Now, the fundamentals of the sector grew at over 35%. So you have a serious disconnection between the fundamentals and the stock market. And I think that's exactly what investors should be looking for if they are looking for a time to buy. So, you know, this is a long-term story. I'm a long-term investor. This is a an approach that's for long-term investors. And when I say long-term, I mean five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. And, and young investors should be looking to take advantage of both the growth in the internet sector in emerging markets and the miracle of compounding. I mean, the, you know, the stock market in the short term is a voting machine and people get bearish, they get bullish, they get greedy, they get fearful. And right now, fear is high and, and there's good reason to be fearful and, and negative. There's a war going on in Europe. There's incredible inflationary pressures. There's been a 
you know, a plague that's essentially disrupted the supply side of almost everything in the world. And then the further supply shocks of the situation with Russia and Ukraine. I mean, we're really in unprecedented times. Interest rates are going up. Inflation's here, at least right now. And and yes, the performance has been terrible. But again, you know, as we say in Omaha, when it's raining gold, bring a bucket, not a thimble. <laughs> okay. And you were talking just there about interest rates and, and inflation. Now, Emerging market central banks have been hiking rates at a faster pace than some of the uh, some of developed central banks. Now that's common. We see that happen quite often. How does this picture and how does this trend of global rate rises and especially in emerging markets play a part into this fund? Well, I think so far they've played a negative part. I mean, again, people are seeing the things you're referencing. They're seeing interest rates go up. Obviously. You know, when you break investing down to its simplest pieces, everything's relative. And the risk-free rate, the the yield you can get for buying the U.S. long bond, that's gone up. And and so the, the, the risk-free rate is higher than everything else being equal. Other asset classes should see multiple compression. And, and so we've seen that in the market. And, and again, I mean, I, you know, you can't tie these things over day to day in terms of performance, but but we've had a, a serious, serious decline. And even before the interest rate and inflation fears showed up, there has been this incredible amount of fear around China, the Chinese government, this incredibly misunderstood delisting threat, which I think is not really a threat fundamentally to anybody losing their money, but it seems to spook the stock market a lot. So um, I don't know how it will all play through, but in the near term, but the long term story is very much intact. I mean, you have billions of people around the world that are becoming consumers. Now, that's, again, going to be impacted by what's going on in the global economy. But but long term, that's a secular trend that is going to continue to go in one direction. Everybody in the world wants this kind of things we take for granted, more and better food, more and better clothing, appliances, vacations, cars, et cetera. And, and that is what McKinsey calls the biggest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. And that's not going away. It might be impacted a little bit. And then the other two mega trends in the EMQQ story are things that you know we've been part of for 25, 30 years, but most of the world's just getting involved. I got my first computer 30 years ago. Well, every second, there's three people in India getting their first ever computer, and it's not on their desk in a traditional sense. It's an Android-based smartphone that probably costs $100, and it's bringing the internet to the world, which is something I've had for 25 years, first on a telephone line. Well, nobody else, you know, we, these are things we take for granted, but the rest of the world is just now getting online. They've never had a bank account. They don't have a cable TV. And and that is going to continue, it, no matter what the the, the near term macro headwinds might be. Yeah, and you were mentioning earlier how the war in Ukraine uh, was, you know, was a, a big impact into the market right now, and this has seen a, a large increase in global food prices. Now we know that some of these emerging markets have a high percentage of their income spent on food and these prices are now increasing. Does this derail the e-commerce story or at least in the short term? No, it doesn't. You know, people will certainly, again, the, the, the world's economic situation is, is definitely going to put an impact on a lot of consumers around the world. But the world's digitizing and food delivery, for example, is, is, is part of that. So I, I don't think that the current things going on in the world are going to derail those basic elements that there's billions of people that are moving on up and they want things and the first thing they want is a smartphone and they're getting those uh, at a very fast rate and that, that's going to continue but, but but there's no doubt that the, the current situation will have sort of storm of different things we have going on they're going to have meaningful macro impacts as we're seeing every day but the longer term story is, is definitely still intact. And do you think potentially that the war in Ukraine has unlocked any untapped potential? Is there any opportunities for emerging markets that you think potentially 
this without the situation they hadn't been put into the spotlight well i i think that there's certainly people that'll benefit from the distortions and disruptions in the energy and food markets but i don't know that there's any clear e-commerce angle to this but i mean we really are in the middle of a, a just unprecedented situation. And you think about the fact that we dealt with a global plague the last two years. It's just now getting to China in a almost bizarre, weird twist to the story. And they're now having to deal with the COVID finally. Um, that's a disruption. The, the movement of people and employees during the, the COVID has, has been a big disruption. And now you've disrupted the world's supply of food and energy. I mean, there's, I'm sure it could get worse, but there's so many things that the world's dealing with right now. And, and in many ways, I mean, I think that the inflation thing has been greatly under, I don't know that the tools we use to measure inflation are really accurate. I remember, you know, it was just four months ago when the fear of inflation started to show up and people would say, oh my gosh, we're going to have 4% inflation and I just remember thinking, well, wait a minute, every house in my city has gone up by at least 50% in cost. Used car prices have actually gone up. So I, and it's not clear to me that that 4% number or the, the recent numbers that are higher, it, it seems very clear to me the way we're actually measuring inflation is far, far from accurate. Okay, and, and just to finish off, I believe your team traveled to Latin America recently um, to meet some of the companies on the ground to get a better feel of the business environment. Can you tell us a bit about what you learned from that trip, from some of your holdings? Sure. So we, we in last month, we did two and a half weeks and we went to Mexico City, Bogota, Colombia, Buenos Aires in Argentina. Uh, Montevideo in Uruguay, and then in Brazil, we were in Sao Paulo and Rio. And I would first say that even before I left, as I was coming up to speed on what was going on in the private side, the venture capital side and the and the startup scene, what I started to see was an ecosystem or a series of ecosystems that had developed in Latin America that were in every way I think more robust and deeper than I had even imagined. There are so many venture funded startups out there, unicorns, dozens and dozens of them in the developing world. And and what you've seen in Latin America and, and it's playing out elsewhere. This is why you know the next decade for this story is so exciting. But Mercado Libre, which which is the uh, e-commerce leader in all of South America. It's actually headquartered in Argentina, so the, the fact sheets will say Argentina, but the company generates its revenue all over Latin America. Brazil is its biggest market, Mexico its second biggest, and it's not just the Amazon.com of Latin America, it's also the PayPal and Wells Fargo, if you will, of Latin America, and it's it's been a huge success and it's a great example of how this story is happening. The company was founded in 1999 by three Argentinian kids that were getting their MBAs at Stanford. And they actually wrote the business plan in the library of the Stanford Business School in Palo Alto, uh, California in 1999. And then they went back to Argentina. And as you're supposed to do, they set up their business in a garage and now, 20 years later, it's worth tens and tens of billions of dollars. The early investors made money. The founders made a lot of money. And then they started to invest in other companies. And you had these, uh, this culture of startups and angel investing. And in fact, two of the uh, early Mercado Libre founders went off a decade ago and started a, a venture fund and, and started funding the next wave. And that included companies like New Bank and you on the New York Stock Exchange, which is the largest online bank in the world out of Brazil. It actually went public in December. As you alluded to earlier, it's gone down. It, it It's down, you know, 30 or 40 percent from its IPO price, which was about 30 percent less than they had thought it might be to start with. And and this is a company that counts Berkshire Hathaway as, as one of its major investors. And and so this virtuous cycle, the startup culture, the venture investors 
this is very early, but it's accelerating in many ways, and it's it's everywhere. I mean, it, you and it's the same story. Local local kids, they go and they get the best educations of the world, which are usually in the United States at Harvard or Stanford or any of our other uh, elite universities. They go to work for Google or Amazon, and then after a few years, they decide they want to start their own business back home, and they're getting funded. And again, the, the number of unicorns coming out of emerging markets is exploding. And I think that the, the biggest takeaway from my trip was how early this is and really how advanced these, these ecosystems have become. And even places like Pakistan have now venture-funded startups that are digitalizing everything in the developing world. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for joining me and sharing your insights and knowledge into the internet and e-commerce industry. Remember, you can trade the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF and many other funds on IG's investments platform. For more videos from us here at IGTV, Join us on Twitter at IGCom, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel.